Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's hands-on lecture. My name is Michelle, and I am a software engineer with the Galaxy Project US team. Today, we'll be walking through the Convolutional Neural Networks CNN's tutorial in Galaxy. Now, if you're new to both machine learning and the Galaxy Project, don't worry. I'll take you through everything step-by-step. -step. By the end, you'll have a good understanding of CNNs and how to use them within Galaxy for image classification. First, let's get familiar with the Galaxy Project platform. Galaxy is an open source platform designed for bioinformatics research, but it has since expanded into other data intensive fields. The Galaxy Project is freely hosted on several major regional platforms, such as usegalaxy.eu for researchers in the EU, usegalaxy.org.au for those in Australia, and usegalaxy.org for researchers in the US, which is the platform I'll be using for this tutorial. Also, as an open source platform, Galaxy's code is available for free download on GitHub, allowing for numerous other public, private, and institutionally self-hosted installations around the world. One of the great features of Galaxy is that it provides a user-friendly interface, so you don't need to run code or uh, complex workflows, to, to run very complex workflows. Here's what Galaxy looks like. On the left, you'll see an activity bar for the major tasks you can accomplish. In the center is the workspace where you run your analysis. And on the right, you have your history panel where every step you run is recorded for saving, sharing, copying, and modifying. To give you a brief preview of what we'll be building in Galaxy today, I've put together this annotated version of the workflow we'll be building today. Even though we will mostly be looking at forms and illustrations, at the end of our work, we can use Galaxy's export to workflow feature to see this alternative uh, visual view of our work. From there, we can annotate with text, color, and illustration. Before we dive into the tutorial, let's start with a brief understanding of convolutional neural networks and how they came into being. So generally speaking, neural networks work through a sequence of steps, where at each step, the solution is gradually refined to become as accurate as possible, given the data set and our resource constraints. In the case of neural networks, the majority of these steps are called layers. You can think of these layers like following a recipe or executing a computer program. However, with neural networks, the data set, often called a data corpus, can vary. And this variation can affect the number of layers needed, the types of layers we take, and ultimately the accuracy of our solution. Convolutional neural networks are a special type of neural network specifically designed to process and analyze visual data, such as images. While CNNs can be used for a wide variety of problem-solving tasks, CNNs are most widely used in image classification tasks. Now, these CNN solutions have documented origins from at least the 1950s, uh, when in 1959, two researchers, Hubel and Wiesel, conducted an experiment to figure out how the brain processes visual information. In this experiment, these two researchers studied the activity of neurons in a cat's visual cortex, where the cortex is the brain's outer layer that plays a key role in thinking, memory, and processing sensory information like sound, touch, and sight. In this particular experiment, while using neuron ac activity sensing equipment on a cat, a bright line was moved in front of the cat's eyes. The researchers discovered that certain neurons, which they called simple cells, would fire when the line appeared at a specific angle and location in front of the cat's eyes. Other neurons, called complex cells, fired whenever the line moved, regardless of its angle or position. It seemed that complex cells were receiving input from multiple simple cells, creating a hierarchy or a sequence set of steps. This discovery led to these researchers winning the Nobel Prize in 1981. As you can imagine, 
Since then, research and experimentation in the field have grown significantly and many techniques have been refined. Today, we have a much clearer understanding of which types of neural networks work best for different kinds of data. Furthermore, we have a much clearer understanding of which steps or layers to apply that make up our model. So the process of applying neural network solutions has become more standardized and structured, making it easier to implement effective models. Now that we generally know the concept behind CNNs, let's talk about its technical components so we can prepare to use it in our tutorial. A typical CNN has the following four types of layers. With exception of the input layer, these layers can appear in varying orders and quantities, depending on our target accuracy, the given data set, and any resource constraints like computational processing time. The first layer of a CNN is the input layer, which takes in the data that the neural network will process. This input can vary depending on the data set. For example, in image classification tasks, common public data sets are CIFAR-10, a data set, image, data set of images of objects like airplanes and cars, ImageNet, which contains thousands of images of objects across a wide range of categories, and MNIST, a data set of handwritten digits we'll be using today. The input layer processes these images typically as pixel values and sends the data to the next layers for further analysis. A little note about MNIST, while today's image recognition capabilities far exceed the ability to recognize handwritten digits, of which there are only a possible possibility of 10 choices, zero through nine. The MNIST dataset is still used today as a standard dataset to compare the accuracy of different types and variations of machine learning models. Also, while the original MNIST database of handwritten digits is composed of a training set of 60,000 images and a test set of 10,000 images, we'll be using a much smaller subset of images to more quickly train our model for the purpose of this tutorial. Lastly, as you may have guessed, image resizing, image normalization, and image centering would normally be done in a pre-processing step. However, the images in MNIST already come size normalized and centered in a fixed sized image. 28 by 28 pixels, which greatly helps simplify the image recognition process. The next layer we will discuss is the convolution layer. This is the layer type from which the CNN gets its name. And this layer consists of multiple filters, also known as kernels. In today's tutorial, we have a 28 by 28 pixel grayscale image. Each pixel is represented by a number between 0 and 255, where 0 represents black, the color black and 255 represents the color white. And the values uh, in between represent different shades of gray. One often cited example to better understand how filters work in a convolution layer is that these filters act like a magnifying glass that slides over the input image, looking at different parts of the image. Now imagine taking this magnifying glass and moving across a photo, focusing on small sections one at a time. Each filter is designed to detect specific features, such as edges, textures, or patterns. The convolution process helps the CNN break down the image into smaller, more manageable pieces, making it easier for the network to understand and recognize important detail. In today's tutorial, we have a three by three filter, nine values in total, and the initial starter values are randomly set to zero or one. We start the process by placing the three by three filter on the top left corner of the image, multiplying filter values by the pixel values and adding the results, then moving the filter to the right one pixel at a time and repeating this process. When we get to the top right corner of the image, we simply move the filter down one pixel and restart from the left. This process ends when we get to the bottom right corner of the image. 
Now within the convolution layer filter parameter, we'll be using the following additional parameters, filter size, padding, stride, dilation, and activation function. For filter size, the larger the size of the filter we just discussed, increases the number of weights to be learned and increases the possibility of overfitting, which we'll talk about later. For padding, we use padding because of the filter, the way of, because of how the filter traverses the image and that we run the risk of not capturing the entire image. So to counter that reductive effect and to keep the resulting image size the same, we can use padding. In today's, in today's example, we pad the input in every direction with zeros before applying the filter. If the padding is one by one, then we add one zero in every direction. If it's two by two, then we add two zeros in every direction and so forth. Now for stride, um, today's tutorial, the stride of the filter is going to be one. Now we move the filter one pixel to the right or down, but we could use a different stride depending on our resource allocation goals or accuracy targets. Now, if we would like to have a larger receptive field without increasing memory size, we could use dilation. If we set the dilation to two instead of uh, a contiguous three by three subset of the image, every other pixel of a five by five subset of the image affects the filter's output. After the filter scans the whole image, we apply an activation function to filter output even further. Activation functions help our model focus on useful signals. These are positive numbers while ignoring the noise. These would be the negative numbers. The activation function used in today's tutorial is ReLU, short for Rectified Linear Unit which leaves pixels with positive values in the filter output as is and replaces negative values with zero. There are many different types of activation functions for various purposes. For example, there is another popular activation function called leaky ReLU, which instead of replacing uh, the noise with zero, it would replace it with a smaller number instead. Moving on, another type of layer is the pooling layer, which helps shrink the size of the image or compresses the image by picking out the most important information from smaller regions. This reduces the amount of data the neural network needs to process, making the learning faster and more efficient while also helping prevent the model from becoming too focused on specific details, which can cause overfitting. Another cited example to better understand why we do not want overfitting in our model is that overfitting is similar to memorizing answers to a test rather than understanding the material. So when the model encounters a new question or in our case, new data, it simply won't understand. And finally, often, but not always, the final layer in a CNN is the fully connected layer. Here, all the nodes from the previous layer are linked together, and this layer's main job is to make the final decision about what the image is. In other words, it takes everything the neural network has learned so far and uses it to classify the image. Now, a couple of final notes. In today's example, while we will be using a one-dimensional channel illustrating shades between black and white image, images, we want, uh, if we wanted to use color images, we could transform our model to a three-dimensional channel illustrating all colors, which can be comprised of red, green, and blue, or RGB for short.
Something else to be aware of additionally in today's tutorial is that it's important to know that we'll be using uh, one hot encoding to turn categories or label labels into numbers. that a computer can understand. So for example, if we had three fruits, apple, orange, banana, and their labels were one, two, and three, the OHE representation of apple would be one, zero, zero. The one hot encoding representation of orange would be zero, one, zero. And the one hot encoding representation of banana would be zero, zero, one. In this way, each fruit has its own separate hot position in the code or one, and the rest are cold positions, or zero. This tells the computer that these categories are completely different from each other without implying any ranking or order. Now let's move on to the tutorial. Before we begin the tutorial, please make sure you are logged into your Galaxy Project user account. If you do not have a Galaxy Project user account, please create one now. It only takes about a minute to complete the required fields for email, password, and a public name. You can follow along this tutorial by visiting this page on the Galaxy Training Network. The Galaxy Training Network, or GTN, contains all of the tutorials for um, Galaxy Project, which have been vetted by the Galaxy Project team. Many of the tutorials contain um, and are linked to published papers and contain a lot of cited work, cited data. So it's easy to find the source of the information. Um, we also welcome other people to submit tutorials and we have instructions how others can do that. Um, and here is a example of some of the partners that we work with to and work in our tutorials. Okay, so as a reminder, we'll be working with the MNIST dataset, which consists of images of handwritten digits so that our trained CNN model can learn patterns in these images to classify them as digits from zero to nine. So here we go. And to avoid navigating away from this page, you can quickly access the tutorial by clicking on the hat icon in the top navigation bar. This will open up the GTN network website we were just on where all the tutorials are located. From there, Actually, if we have to go to the main page, because I'm already here, so it will open in uh, the main page here. And then from there, you can just search for CNN for the tour we'll be doing. And then next to hands-on, select the CNN link to open the tutorial in the window. So if you scroll down past the lecture notes and where the steps begin for the tutorial, we can get started. So as with often almost all Galaxy tutorials, uh, they start with a get data uh, portion. And the usually the first step in that is to create a new history. Histories are used in Galaxy to track um, how the workflow or how a series of um, data have come together. And um, you can share history, you can copy history, um, and most importantly, you can just refer back to it. So if you wanna remember what you did previously, it's, um, it's easy to have that handy. So this step says that we're going to create a new history by clicking on the plus icon in the history panel on the right. And then we're gonna rename the history to Galaxy Introduction. So let's go ahead and click off of the window and window, and we'll go ahead and click New History. And if we click the pencil icon, we can change the name to Galaxy Introduction. And then when you're all ready, click the Save button. 
Great. Now, if we go back to the hat icon at the top, you'll see that it remembers where in the page we were last on. So we can just move really easily down to the next step. And this step says that we need to import the files from Zenodo, which is a open source data sharing platform. In this example, we have four files represented by these four URLs. And we're gonna just copy all of them. So hit the copy button. And then the next step is that we're going to upload the data from Zenodo. And it's gonna pull it uh, into the Galaxy platform for our account. And so go ahead and select, uh, after we upload the data from the toolbar, we're going to select paste fetch data, click the start button and close it. We don't even have to wait for the data to load. It'll, as soon as we hit start, it'll be in progress and we won't be able to stop it. So let's go ahead and do that next. Here's the upload in the activity bar. Here's the upload um, modal. If we click the paste fetch data button and then in the text space, we can just paste, click the start button, click the close button. And then over here on the right, we can see it's building our first data histories. Um, and you can see that data histories for one, they're gonna be enumerated. Um, and we have one, two, three, and four. So the most recent one will be at the top, the most recent action of their history. And we also can see that there's some processing icons. There's some color here. The first color actually was gray, but it usually just blinks on. Then the next color shows when it's in progress. Um, and that's this orange yellow color. And when it's complete, it will finally turn green. Okay, so while that is processing, we'll just wait, should be pretty quick. We can also look at some of the data already before it's completed um, by clicking on the bar to expand more information. We can add some tags if we want to um, mark it in some way or make a note of it. Um, this is not really a gene, so maybe not the most helpful. And then if we refresh, Okay, there, we can see that our data has loaded and now clicking on the bar to expand shows um, that we have 6,000 lines in this file. The format has been auto understood as a text file. So that might be something we need to change. And we get a little preview of some of the top lines in the file. If we wanna see what everything that's in the file or most everything, we can click on the eyeball uh, icon here, and we can see the numbers uh, in the file. And it's pretty much the same for these other values and other files. Okay, so let's move on to the next step. We're gonna click on the hat icon in the top navigation. Oh, because we refreshed the page, um, we're gonna have to scroll back down, which is no problem. Just something to keep in mind if you refresh. Okay, so now we're gonna start the next step, which is to rename the data sets as X train, Y train, X test, and Y test. So basically we're gonna remove the file extension here. And we're also going to make sure in the next step that the data type is set to um, tabular. And we do that by clicking on the pencil icon to edit. Uh, clicking on the data types tab in the top uh, and assign data types, we will select and find the tabular button. So to get started, we'll just start from the top here and we'll remove the extension. If we click the save button, click the data types. Okay, so it did not select auto to determine it was a tabular. So we need to type it in here and then save. And we're gonna go ahead and do that for all the rest of the files. And we do need to click save in between every um, tab. So this actually auto did detect it uh, correctly um, by saying uh, tabular. So we don't need to make any more changes there. Um, so we're on the next item. 
and we can say, save, click data types tab. It did not auto detect correctly. So we're gonna say tabular and save again. Great, so now we're all set. We've got one more maybe, let's see if this one, okay, one more. It's pretty quick. And this auto selected tabular, so we're all set there. Now let's move to the next step. If we click on the hat icon, we can then, okay, so we're gonna move to the classification portion. And we had talked about one hot encoding previously. Um, so this time we're gonna actually open up a tool called two categorical. Now there are many ways you can get to the tool interface. Um, one is to uh, click on act the activity bar and you could use the tool search here and we can search for two categorical. And this converts a class vector to a binary class matrix, which is just what we want. Now, another way to get here is if we're in a tutorial, that this is actually a link um, that's been used uh, in this tutorial example. So we can use this link, we can email this link to someone else. Um, and if we just click it, it will automatically open in our analysis panel. So once it opens, we're gonna select the input file of Y train, and we're gonna say it does not contain headers and the number of classes is 10. So let's go ahead and do that. Select Y train for the input file. It does not contain headers, so select no. And for the total number of classes is 10 because we're looking at zero through nine. There's also an option for an email notification so that if you're running something particularly um, resource intensive uh, in, in Galaxy, there are tools that can run from anywhere from a few seconds to a few days. So this comes in handy uh, when it's a longer time period. Now we just click run tool and it will again process and add another row to our history. So that should be pretty quick. So I'm gonna actually just go ahead and bring up the next step while that's processing. So this step is a more involved this is actually the sort of the configuration for the model. We're gonna kind of give it the instructions and the parameters that not only fit our data set, but fit on how we want to, um, I guess, uh, analyze it in our particular way, our particular recipe, our particular uh, program instructions. Okay, so this information completed. So we'll go ahead and open this up. And the other thing about this step is that it's composed of several layers. We've got seven layers here. So instead of going back and forth um, with all the different parameters, I'm actually just going to open this up um, by go ahead and clicking on the tab itself. And then I'm just going to kind of go through it um, separately. So that's just one. Um, form for you to look at. So the first thing that uh, we're going to look at is this um, option that says select Keras model type. Keras is a um, library, a coding library to make machine learning processes uh, more simple. So here we have a sequ sequential um, method that we're going to be accessing and it's gonna be asking for the shape. Um, so go ahead and put in the shape of 784, which is 28 times 28. And um, we'll move on to our layers. So the first layer we're gonna do is a core reshape layer um, because it's uh, a 28 by 28 pixel item with one channel. Our input is going to be 28, 28, one. Uh, within parentheses and commas separating the numbers. From there, we're going to add our second layer. So click the insert layer button and then select convolutional uh, two-dimensional. With a filter um, of 64 and a kernel size of three. For this, we're gonna choose an activation function of ReLU. 
which we talked about earlier. And we're gonna have a padding equal to same. From here, we're gonna add another layer. So this is our third layer. And it's going to be a pooling layer, which is going to be max pooling two-dimensional. The pool size for this is going to be two by two. And we're not gonna use strides. So now we're gonna go ahead and insert our next layer, which is gonna be layer four. So this layer is going to be a convolutional uh, 2D layer. And we're going to have 32 filters and a kernel size of three and the activation function will be ReLU. From here, we're gonna insert another layer um, and we're gonna have the type of pooling. Again, max pooling two dimensional and pool size of two by two. Now we're gonna have our sixth layer, we're almost there and it's gonna be a core flatten. And we're gonna leave these defaults in place. Oh, hang on, that changed the wrong one. Let me just quickly correct that. So this is max pooling. This is two, layer five, layer six is core flattening. Okay, leave this in place. And then our last layer, layer seven, is going to be core dense with units 10 and activation function. We're gonna use something called soft max. Okay, so. A lot of layers here, and I'm just going to quickly double check how we're doing. And um, then I'm just going to set run tool. So as um, described in the lecture notes, um, each image is passed in a 784 dimensional vector, which is 28 by 28 pixels. And um, the reshape layer reshapes it with the one channel um, because we're just using grayscale. It would be three channels if we were using color. Um, the second convolutional layer has 32 filters. An output would be 32 dimensional and a filter size of three by three. Both pooling layers have a max pooling size of two by two. So there's a little more notes in the tutorial um, page uh, that you can check out later and you can also see where that's coming from the data. Okay, so the next step is to create a deep learning model. Um, now that we have the configuration set up. And so we're just gonna go ahead and move here. Um, actually, we'll go ahead and use the tool search, create deep learning model. We go to tools and You can click it and open just as easily. So to choose a building model, we're gonna select build a training model and that should actually be pre-selected. Um, for selecting the data site set containing model configurations, um, we're gonna use the configurations from the prior step we just created. Uh, for the question to do classification or regression, we're going to do the Keras G classifier uh, and for our compile parameters, uh, we're going to select a loss function of categorical cross entropy. Uh, for the optimizer, we're going to use Atom. And for the metrics, should already be selected accuracy, but just make sure that you have it there. And for the epochs, we're going to select two and a batch size of 500 and then go ahead and select run tool and leave the rest um, of the defaults in place. So while that's running, um, a couple of things to note that um, epochs is the number of times the whole training data is used to train the model. So setting epochs to two means each training example in our data set is used twice to train our model. If we update 
um, the network weights bias after all the training data is fed to the network, the training will be very slow, but we could get higher degrees of accuracy as well. So that's an uh, easy and uh, way to control for um, any resource constraints by just adjusting the number of epochs up and down. Okay, so it looks like that is completed. So now we're gonna move on to deep learning training and evaluation steps. So if you click on the hat icon in the upper navigation, move on to the next step, which is, says deep learning training and evaluation. So the first uh, field it's gonna ask is uh, about selecting a schema. And we're gonna obviously say train and validate. Uh, and then we need to choose the data set containing a pipeline estimator object. For this, it is the um, Keras model builder from the prior step. And so that almost always populates in Galaxy as the prior step and just assumes you're building um, chronologically, but you don't have to. Um, you can select uh, you know, other data sets that uh, basically fit the format that it will be predetermined for this tool. Okay, so moving on under select input type, um, we should have tabular data pre-selected. For training samples data set, we should select X train. And we should have um, choose how to select data by column. We should select all columns. And then on the um, data set containing class labels or target values option, it should say, we wanna select two categorical on Y train, which um, yes, it's selecting, auto-selecting um, through some logic in the back end, um, which one works and which one is the most recent. Um, and then choose how to select columns, we're going to also select all columns again. So I'm just going to double check and make sure all of those look good to me. Okay, so when we're ready, just go ahead and click run tool and let that process. So now for the final step, almost final step that we've been waiting for, which is the prediction step. Um, so model prediction tool um, is really going to, you know, it's yeah, as it says, it's going to generate one data set that's a file and has predictions um, zero to nine for the predicted digits for every image in the test data set. Uh, so we're going to get basically a file with a, a bunch more numbers back. It's not going to be uh, great to look at, but then our final step will be to create a visualization that will more easily kind of group and categorize how we did. So it looks like that step has completed. So go ahead and open the model prediction tool. And from the choose the data set containing pipeline estimator object, um, select the train model from the prior step. Um, and then we're going to actually just move to the select invocation method option, which is going to be predict and should be auto selected. And then the select input data type for prediction tabular data should also auto be auto selected. Um, training samples data set. Um, you want to select X test and choose how to select data by column. We're going to select all columns once again and then go ahead and click Run Tool. Great. So while this runs, we can talk about the final step, which is the visualization extension. So one of the nice things about Galaxy is um, all the different options and visualizations that we have. Um, everything from bar charts, 
um, to genome browsers, to um, heat maps and um, actual maps to almost everything you could think of. And we're always trying to add more visualizations. So in this case, we're going to use a, um, a grouping kind of color coordinator visualization called a confusion matrix. And um, we can go ahead and click on the hat. Now that this is done completing, we can click on the hat at the top and then um, move on to the confusion matrix, which is going to distinguish our true positives from our um, false positives and our true negatives. So this is what it's going to kind of look like. Go ahead and open up the machine learning visualization extension. And we want to select the confusion matrix option. And for the data set containing true labels, select Y test. Um, and for choosing how to select data by column, select all columns. And for select data set containing the predicted labels, select model prediction from the prior step. Does the data set contain header? Yes, it does now. So select yes, and then go ahead and click run tool. And for fun, if you wanna change around the colors, that's fine, but I'm just gonna leave it green for now. So this is the final step. And um, from here, we can kind of see how well we did. It's gonna show us uh, how well we did in the diagonal set of numbers in a table. And, um, you know, we could adjust these uh, variables and we could rerun them if we want to go back and, you know, instead of running two epics, we want to run 20 epics. We can easily do that and see if our accuracy changes from one confusion matrix to another. Okay, so that's done completing. So let's go ahead and view that by clicking on the eyeball icon. And there we have our matrix. And here we have our predict our um our labeled values that we're trying to predict the prediction labels how often we're right and it's it's pretty good this is fairly high number which is what we want to see it could be better but it's pretty good for a first run so now as I mentioned in um, the first part of the discussion we're going to see if we can export this and um, make it into a nice workflow. Uh, with connector nodes. So in the history panel on the right, there is an icon with three lines. Um, it should say history options when you hover over it. And if you go ahead and select extract workflow, what's going to happen is um, in the analysis panel, we're going to start building um, a visual of the history that we just created. And then if you go ahead and click the create workflow, And then here in the notification at the top, you can go ahead and click edit to view. And then here is um, an unannotated version of what I had created um, previously from this step. So if you wanna go ahead and um, annotate it further, you can use this um, sort of toolbar over here and you can see all the exact things that um, one might wanna do. So for instance, if you wanna frame some of the content, uh, maybe you, oops, let's see here, let's move this over. You can move the frame and you can sort of drag and drop these. because not all the parameters when you look at it might be present. So we can name this confusion matrix and we can make it green since we ended up making a green confusion matrix um, and, and that sort of thing. All sorts of um, textual annotations, highlights, and even a drawing tool. So this concludes our machine learning um, convolutional neural network tutorial. Um, you know, If you have further questions, please join us on our matrix element channel. Uh, for Galaxy. Uh, the lobby channel is a great place to start asking questions. Um, also, definitely familiarize yourself with the Galaxy Training Network website. There are many resources and many ways to contact us for help. 
or for their assistance, we have an annual conference um, that you're all welcome to come to. And we also have regular events, regular workshops all around the globe.